God, I will exalt you and praise your name, for in perfect faithfulness you have done wonderful things, things planned long ago. Let's stand and sing praises to the Lord, the one who loves us. Come to the 
sinners come find his mercy come to the table he will satisfy
set on you And you made me here today With mercies that are new All my fears and doubts They can all come to Because they can't stay long When I'm here with you It's a new horizon And I'm set on you songs that are rooted in scripture we sing God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that's John 3 16 and then we also sang uh, the way which comes straight from Jesus lips in John 14 6 he said I am the way the truth and the life and whoever and no one comes to the father except through me and so as Christians you know we know these verses really well they're kind of like core uh, scriptures um, and so we know them they're easy to sing they're fun um, to sing what we believe but then you think about how hard it is to actually live what we believe. That's the hard part. The good news is that even though we all struggle um, in our lives and we deal with a lot of things and we succumb to temptation, we can still find comfort through Jesus because of the way he lived. He said later on in John 14, because I live, you also will live. So let's go to God in a silent prayer of confession this morning and uh, let's ask God to be all right, let's uh, be honest with God about the ways that we've let him down, and let's ask for forgiveness. So let's bow our heads. God, thank you that we can gather together as a church to worship you and to sing praises to your name and for the opportunity to be able to come before you and ask for forgiveness. So God, here are our confessions now. God, thank you for loving us, and thank you for sending Jesus to die for us, and thank you for forgiving us and welcoming us into your family. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. And we are assured of God's saving grace by what Romans 8.34 says about what Jesus has done and is doing for us. It says, who is in a position to condemn? Only Jesus. And Christ, he died for us, and he rose for us, and he reigns in power for us, and he prays for us so we can find comfort in that.
All right, let's turn and greet the people next to you. Good to be with you this morning. Uh, beautiful day. Seems like we haven't said that maybe for, for quite a while here. Just sh sunshine and, and warmer warmer weather would be a nice time to just gather outside and fellowship a little bit after our service. We just finished worshiping with our singing, and now we can also worship in our giving. Giving. We just have one offering this morning to be received for the ministries of this church. But I'd like to pray for it before the deacons come up. Father, we're not our own but we belong to you. You have created us and given us new life. We extend our arms and open our hands to present our offerings to you. We make these gestures to display outwardly our hearts overflowing gratitude for all your gifts. Receive these gifts from us, O God, and through them bring life and hope to many. In the name of Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, amen. That's okay. I got a few announcements. We'll just start kind of looking backwards in the past and just kind of move our way into, into the future here. Um, just thankful yesterday for our cadets and cadet leaders. I think we had uh, 20 boys and a bunch of leaders go up to Chino at Cross Point CRC there for the, the Pinewood Derby races. It doesn't sound like the Long Beach cars are real fast, but we're really creative. So we, we won four, four trophies for design. I think it's kind of neat just to hear some of the things they came up with. Uh, we had one car that was a Swiss Army knife car, and one that was a golden spike, a car that looked like a toaster, and a car that was a hot dog. And so, <laughs> no wonder we didn't break any speed records there. Uh, I won't name which of my sons, his car didn't get to the finish line, so sometimes that happens. Um, we're thankful for good counselors and, and all they do to minister to our boys. Um, that's looking backwards, looking forwards a little bit. This week, Wednesday, we do not have our normal... Wednesday night activities and ministries. It's a week off for spring break. Got a lot of families out and traveling and 
um, that sort of thing. It's nice to give our, our leaders a week off as well. So nothing this Wednesday, and we'll resume again the week after that. Uh, speaking of moving forward, the reading plan that many of us have been going on is about to expire. We read James 3 today, and then James 4 tomorrow and 5, and then that's it for that old reading plan we've been going through for the last several months. There's a new one in the back. I encourage you to pick up this card. Uh, TJ made it look really sweet like he always does, and it just it's titled Spring 2023, and because after we finish James today, the sermons moving forward are kind of a little bit here and there and everywhere. We have, of course, Palm Sunday next week, and Pastor Carl will preach. That way I can get ready for both Good Friday and Easter Sunday. And then shortly after that, we have Jim Sunday and Cadet Sunday. And I'm also in there going to preach a sermon series on the book of Ruth. And so kind of a wide variety of things. So the card doesn't reflect the sermons necessarily because the sermons are you know, a little bit uh, just tailored to the season and, and particular things going on there. But I will make one more note on here. You, you notice the front side. These readings I just kind of put together so they, they follow along the path of uh, Passion Week as we start that next Sunday. So just on Sunday, Triumphal Entry, and then readings that would take place on any given day. So hopefully we can sort of in that way follow in Jesus' journey to the cross as well. And then we'll continue after that. If you're not with the program, get with the program. Grab a bookmark. Read your Bible one chapter a day. It's, it's daily bread. It's food for our souls. I highly encourage you to do that. Um, I think that's it for announcements. I do have a couple prayer requests as Rick makes his way up here. Um, he could probably tell you more, but Darlene Van Winkle went in on Thursday for a regular check with the cardiologist, and he said, go straight to the ER, Darlene. Uh, her heart's working at a really low, like 20-some percent efficiency, and so falls asleep a lot and, and, and tired and that sort of thing. So um, went and saw her yesterday, and, and she's comfortable, but got a, got a road of recovery to go to and uh, lots of tests and things like that as they figure that out. And then one more, Rick, uh, Micah. Uh, Micah lives with uh, the Sprick family, right? So some of you recognize Micah around here. He took a bad fall and actually broke his hip and is headed for surgery. And, and Roger and Sharon are out of town, so just wisdom for them to know how to get back and to help manage him through that. And and all those different things. So a couple of prayers there. And a, and a praise, you know, many of you already know, we had a great MRI for Clay this week, uh, clear scans again. So we're just thankful for, for no cancer, no tumors, and it's, it's just great. So I'll welcome up Rick. Thank you, Pastor Brian. Anybody have any prayer requests to go to our living Lord. Because he lives, we have a Lord and a Savior that hears our prayers. What can I pray for you today? Yes. Their teacher, Miss Davison, who hasn't been teaching for a while because she was pregnant, <clears throat> had her baby, but it's doing very bad. She's the little girl's not doing good. So prayers for their baby. Okay. It's a really severe type of disease she has, but the doctors don't know what to do. So we're all praying hard for her. We don't know if the baby's going to make it. Okay. So we'll be praying. Breathing on her own, eating on her own, all that. So we'll, we'll be praying pray. for the baby. And how long ago was she born? What was her name? Um, when was she born? Girl? May 15th. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, Mary. Okay. Prayers for Haiti. And they're having such difficulty down there. They don't have fuel. They don't have food. They have a lot of difficulty down in Haiti, correct? Yes. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. Prayers for the, um, the town that was shipping the debt from Adelson to Greenland. Down here in the Mississippi. Oh, Mississippi. Is that Chris? Okay, so 
nephew Chris has passed away. And I know that uh, both you and Chris sitting next to you have uh, shared the love of Christ with him and hopefully he heard it and he was able to make that decision for Christ. So. Anybody else? Yeah, Jonathan. Oh my goodness. So uh, she, my aunt had been battling MS for most of her adult life, and she finally lost the battle. But she's home with the Lord now. Amen. That was Thursday night? Yep. Yeah, your mom's been through a real difficult yes. time. Three family members. Three family members lost Jonathan's mother in the last few months, including her father. Yep, we'll remember her for sure, Jonathan. Anybody else? Just to give a little quick update on Don and Darlene, particularly Darlene Bryan did a good job of that. We, Linda and I were there last night. Larry and Karen are still here, thankfully. And uh, she did take a CT, she got a CT scan yesterday. We haven't got the results. We called them earlier today with no answer. So if you could just pray for them. Um, yesterday, she, the only thing she wanted was vanilla ice cream. So <laughs> if you know Darlene, that makes sense. Uh, yeah. And it was interesting, we walked in, Linda and I walked in yesterday afternoon with, uh, she was lying there on the right side, kind of in the fetal position, sound asleep. And when we brought the vanilla ice cream to her, she rose up like Lazarus almost. So, <laughs> so that, was, that was a good thing. So if you can pray, and particularly pray for Don, he's kind of lost right now. It makes sense, you know. So uh, we did talk to him this morning, and he's, he didn't sleep at all last night. So just those type of things. So that, that's kind of an update on Don and Darlene. So uh, thankfully we can go to Jesus who lives. Huh? Let's go to prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Father, you and you alone are worthy of all praise, all honor, and all glory. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Please accept our praise and worship, and Father, we pray that you'll hear the prayers of your children today. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Father, our world needs you. We live in a broken, hurting world. Wars, rumors of wars, unrest, Things that are so wrong being championed as right, and things that are so right being condemned as wrong. Father, we need you now. And to that end, Father, we pray for strength and wisdom and courage for the church universal, the church everywhere, to be a beacon of light and hope and truth to a lost and hurting world. Father, we pray that you will bless our missionaries and our pastors everywhere. Keep them safe. Keep them energized. Keep them healthy. And help them know that they are appreciated. Father, we pray for our missionary, the Lees in Mexico. We pray for Jordan working for you in the missionary field with YWAM. Father, we pray for the Branderhorst family as well as Pastor Jordan Hall and his family as a minister to the Bethany CRC in Bellflower. And Father, also we pray for our neighboring Christian churches on this corner. Father, in regards to thy will be done. Father, many of us have unsaved family members or friends. And we pray for the salvation of them right now, Father. We pray that you'll send the Holy Spirit to tug on their hearts and minds so that they can see that you and you alone are the way, the truth, and the life, and that they will accept that and live for eternity with you in heaven. Father, give us our day, this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Father, we pray today for those who suffer silently with chronic pain. 
whether it's physical, emotional, or mental pain. Help them find hope first in you for eternal hope and healing. And Father, we pray that their struggles and pain will have an expiration date, but the hope that you give does not. Thank you for this season of Advent where we look forward to remembering the cost that Christ paid for our salvation. And ultimately, Resurrection Sunday, the Sunday after Good Friday, and the victory that we have over sin and death because of Christ. But today, Father, as we live in the broken world, we pray that you will help those in a very special way that need you. Father, first, we thank you for the answered prayers for Clay and for the whole Branderhorst family in regards to Clay's clean scan. We rejoice with them. Father, we thank you that the cadets and the leaders could go yesterday out to Chino and have a great day. Father, we thank you for those times, and uh, we just uh, ask that you'll bless our children and our youth. Be with them as they rub elbows with adults of many generations that love you and help the love that we show them is a true reflection of your love. Father, we pray for Darlene in the hospital now. We pray for Don. We ask that you'll give a clear uh, and present and wise way forward. Help the doctors as they're a little bit confused right now. We know that you'll be with them uh, going forward. Father, we pray for the Haberbush, the loss of uh, Lorraine's mom and the knee replacement. Father, we also pray for Susan recovering from knee surgery. Father, we pray for Bruce and Julie's great-grandson, Easton, and Father, we thank you for hearing our prayers. We also pray for Micah, the young man that lives with the Sprick family who fell and has broken his hip with them being gone, Father. Please give him your peace and your comfort and may a good way forward be given for that young man. Father, we pray for the baby in need that is fighting for her life from the Vanderskoff uh, teachers. Father, we pray for that family how difficult it is. Father, we pray for the nation of Haiti. All the needs that they have there seems to be so overwhelming that they don't know what to do, Father, but may we look to you, may they look to you, and may where possible we can give them help. Help us to do that, Father. Father, we ask for the people in Mississippi that are fighting through a tornado that, that was devastating and that took the lives of at least 25 people, Father, we pray for those, for those families in that area. Father, we also pray for Lucinda's family. Father, young Chris passed away yesterday or this week. And Father, we thank you for your message of salvation that both Lucinda and Chris shared with him before he passed. Father, our prayer is that he would have said yes to you, but comfort the family that remains, Father, please. And Father, we ask that you'll be in a very special and real way with Jonathan's mother. She's lost three family members just in the last couple of months, uh, and she lost her sister just this past week Thursday. Father, be with her in a very real way. Wrap your loving arms right tightly around her so that she can feel your love and your peace. Father, we thank you that we can bring all of these things to you and many others that are unspoken. Father, we ask that you'll bless the children's message today and give us all ears to hear and hearts to be challenged and encouraged from Pastor, Mes Pastor Brian's message today. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Kids, you may come up for chil uh, children's message right now. And it looks like Pastor Brian is going to be doing that. You guys have maybe seen one of these before, right? 
it's, it's a transformer. Maybe you've seen one of these too. It's, it's really neat. You, you can basically, it turns from a car to a, like a robot man or something, right? I think I can figure this out. I, I practiced earlier. I just flip that guy down and then boom, right? We got, we got this guy in his, in his wings and you got one of these before? Okay, good. How many? Seven. Seven transformers. So here's a transformer, right? Like, so this guy's kind of, he's a man, and then next thing you know, he's, he's a car again. He's transformed. But the Bible talks about transformed too. Right? The Bible talks about being transformed, and it means to go about some dramatic or thorough change. Now, thorough, that's a big word. Like, it's completely, it changes all of us. Not just like a little part of you, but the whole thing from the inside out. So the Bible teaches that when God wants to transform us or change us, he wants to make us like Jesus, right? He's not making us into a car or an airplane or something. He wants to make us like Christ. And so he changes us on the inside, right? He changes us on the in, and he changes us in the up, and he changes us in the out, right? On the inside, he changes our hearts so that we love him and that we love the things that he loves. He changes our minds so that we can see things like he sees. He changes our attitudes. He gives us new identity. He gives us new purpose. But he also changes us on the up, right? This way between us and God that we might trust him more, that we might listen to him better, that we would worship him, that we would pray to him, that we would follow his commands. Do you follow me? So he transforms us in here and he transforms us between us and God. And then he transforms us with one another. He makes us forgiving. He makes us loving. He makes us kind. He teaches us how to serve. He wants to change us on the inside out, right here, and between us and God, and between us and others, all because he wants to make us like Jesus. So that's one of my favorite things about being a Christian is when God saves us, he doesn't just save us, he starts to change us, and he makes us new. Let's pray for God to do that. God, we thank you for making us new. We thank you for your transforming power that you give us through the work of the Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, to be uh, strong participants in that. And especially right now, I think of these children. I just ask that you would bless them and, and work in them and change them even as they're young, Lord. And that they would be molded and shaped to your image and to your glory. Walk with them day by day. Help them to see you as the ultimate example of all that's good and true and beautiful. In your name we pray, amen. Don't worry, he'll give it back. Let's jump right into James chapter 5. We'll look at verses 12 through 20. James 5, 12 through 20. Hear the word of the Lord. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you will be condemned. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. 
that we've been looking at here in James for the last few months, we just pray that as we wrap this up, that you would plant the seeds that were sown deep in our hearts, that you would make them grow and produce much fruit to your glory. In your name we pray. Amen. So I've been three months in James, and here we are at the finish line. I'm thankful for the book of James. I'm thankful for all the different things and lessons that we've been taught. I hope it's been as much of a blessing to you as it has been to me. I found it rich from beginning to end. Ten different sermons, five different chapters, 108 verses. But who's counting? But as we land this plane, I got to admit, I wrestled hard with what to do with this last section of Scripture. Because it seems like it's really disorganized and it jumps from one thing to the next. But it's just not me that looks and sees some organizational, you know, kind of a lack of clarity there. In all my research this week, it seems like even scholars can't agree with how to organize and theme these last several verses. You might have noticed even last week I departed from the NIV's like normal scope and sequence of things. Because there's that, that verse 12 that we started with today. Like if you look in your Bibles right now, you see verse 12 typically gets lumped in with the verses before it. I've chosen to go with the verses after it, but either way, it doesn't seem to fit great. But letter endings are often like that. They often jump from one thing to the next. You might remember reading from Hebrews the other day, Hebrews 13, in our reading plan. And in Hebrews 13, it was like rapid fire, one encouragement, one different challenge. Like each verse seemed to have a totally different theme. The letters of Paul do that too. You finish up a letter of Paul, say something like this in the very last verses stay faithful. Don't do anything I wouldn't do and say hi to your mother for me. <laughs> the end of James is a little bit like that too, right? It has like these rapid fire, like three different things that go on here. So as I wrestled with all this, a couple things compelled me to organize this very last message in James. First, I want to take all of this as a unit and try to look at it at the big picture. And I want to do that in the context of the entirety of James. So if you're really astute with the ear this morning, you're going to hear me roll back a lot of the different themes we've looked at over the last three different months and, and hear those things. And I really encourage you to have your Bibles open this morning because we'll kind of do a little scavenger hunt and we'll be referring back to some of the old stuff as we do that. And then one last thing for me, I don't ever want to lose the forest through the trees. You know, that, that old frank phrase, like you get zoomed in so tight on something that you miss the big picture. So open your Bibles with me if you don't mind, and we'll just kind of trace from the beginning what James is talking about here is this overall transformation. Or as you, if you start in chapter 1, he warns against being an adulterous people, against being divided. He says that we're, we're, we're double-minded. We don't look like we should. And then he points out in chapter 1, verse, I think it was 17, that God is pure, right? There is no shadow side to God. He is pure throughout, consistent all the way through. And he implies this, that we shouldn't be divided either. He wants believers to be mature, complete. He wants us to be transformed. So his prescription is in James 1.21. Here is his solution to this division that we often find ourselves with. He says, humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. But then he doesn't stop there. He says, do what it says. You want to be transformed? You don't want to be divided up and, and have all these different compartments in your life? Hear the word of God and then do the word of God. And so the rest of the letter then shows us what this actually looks like. We get these pictures of holistic transformation. If you go to chapter 2, we see that faith doesn't get caught just in the brain, but faith actually does. Faith moves us. It compels us. Faith works. And then in chapter 3, we see this connection of the inside of a person to the outside of the person, right? Consistent all the way through. Evidenced by the way we talk. Evidenced by the way that we live. Because the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. And our actions are moved by our inner workings, by our desires, whether they're heavenly ones or whether they are earthly ones. Transformation from the inside out. And then the letter finishes. In the last few weeks, we've looked at chapters Four and five, and we see how a changed perspective changes how we live, right? Our management of time, we saw that one in, in chapter four, right? Our, our money in chapter five and perseverance in chapter five. A, a heavenly perspective changes all of this, right? He wants to transform our thinking. 
See, the person who has an earthly perspective, well, they'll waste time, they'll hoard money, and they'll, they'll stumble in the hardships. But the person who has the mind of Christ, the person who has a transformed mind, they will steward their time well. They don't treasure the world, they treasure Christ. And they will persevere in hardships, for they see it like God sees it. But then James brings it to a close right where we're at here today. He is after complete maturity. And so he calls the believer to be consistent in thought and word and deed. And this transformation affects all spheres of our life. Our inner workings, our relationship with God, and then also our relationship with others. So in this passage today, as I look at it through a big picture sort of lens, I'm just going to organize this thing and say the in, the out, and the up. The in, right, what God is doing in here, and then the up, what he is doing with God, and then the out, what he is doing with other people. So the first dimension we see here in this passage is the in. James wants to see that we are transformed on the inside, and he sees that by how we speak. This is nothing new to James. If we go back to chapter 1, he says, Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongue deceive themselves. Their religion is worthless. Because this is an indicator of that. In chapter 2, he exhorts and says, Speak and act. Speak as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. In chapter 3, he dedicates 12 whole verses to the tongue. In chapter 4, James warns about slander and he warns about boasting. And last week in chapter 5, he warns about grumbling. So you can tell, like, speech matters a lot. And now he talks about more speech. He talks about making oaths. He says in verse 12, Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you will be condemned. As is typical in this letter, he is echoing words from his brother Jesus, where in Matthew 5, he says basically the same thing. These passages are easily misunderstood because of that word swear. We don't, we don't often use the word swear in that context. When we think of swearing, we might think of you know, the vulgar four-letter words that you know, we aren't supposed to say. But what he's talking about here in terms of swearing is in terms of making an oath or making a promise. Like little kids do this. Like, Dad, do you promise? I'm like, yeah, I promise. But like, pinky promise? They'll come to me like, yeah, pinky promise. Cross your heart, hope to die. Like, sure, buddy, whatever. Like, I, I already told you. Yeah, he's talking about that sort of making oaths and promises. And James to this says, enough already. Every single word you say ought to be trusted. You don't need to put a conditional promise or statement to clarify it. Either yes or no. Be a straight talker. God doesn't give qualifiers to his promises, and neither should you. This is a matter of integrity. This is about the inside. So only the person who, whose word is no good has the need to add these different qualifiers. Or think of it this way. Swearing in this way, right, these oaths and promises, it's a polluted form of honesty. It's only as committed as it's convenient to be. But James is urging for more. He's urging for purity on the inside. The person whose words are a reflection of a heart that's being transformed. So may the gospel transform us so that we're thoroughly occupied by grace, that the words we say are a reflection of what God is doing in us. He wants to transform us on the inside. But this transformation doesn't stop there. Not only does he want to change us here, he also wants to change us here in our relationship with the Father. So like our words are a barometer for what's going on here, so prayer is an indication of what's going on in this relationship. And this isn't anything new to this letter either. James has talked much about prayer. So as I go back through these other old verses on prayer from James, you'll notice that he doesn't focus really on the mechanics of prayer, but on the heart and the attitude that undergirds it. For example, in chapter 1, he, he asked the readers to ask God, right, to pray to God for wisdom because he's worried about their prayers. He says, don't pray as one who has double-minded or one who is full of doubt, Chapter 4, he also mentions prayer and says this in verses 2 and 3. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong 
motives. So he'd been throughout this letter already saying, you've got the wrong motives when you pray. You're double-minded. You're full of doubts when you pray. But now he's getting to the end. He's saying, now, those are the wrong stuff. Let me show you the right stuff. The foundations of a praying heart. And if you look at this passage, I see three things kind of pop out. One is I call intimacy and then righteousness and earnestness. So let me go through those three quickly as we talk about this relationship as evidenced by prayers. First, intimacy. Now, I know there's different words I could have used here, but I say intimacy because James paints a picture of a person who is always going to God, always going to God. I mean, the people that you go to the most, the people that you tell everything to are the people that you're closest to, correct? Right? There's an intimacy there. There's a level of trust there. There's a dependence there. So he's going to God. He's going to God. He's always praying. He says, if you're in trouble, pray. If you're happy, sing songs of praise. If you're sick, pray. If you're sinful, pray. Pray all the time. Keep praying. It's intimacy with God. It shows our deep need for him. When we pray, we're saying, God, I can't do this on my own. Really, really in that way, like this healthy prayer that James is searching for, it's a direct reflection of our salvation in the first place. On my own, I'm lost. I need you. I depend on you. So we pray like that as well. Speaking of intimacy, I think this passage kind of reveals like deepening layers of intimacy. Think about it here. See what you think of my, my theory. First, we have the person who prays when they're in trouble. I'll just say that's pretty basic. Everybody prays when they're in trouble. Even atheists pray when they're in trouble. There, there's nothing much intimate about that. But then the next step he goes, he says, is anyone happy? They should sing songs of praise. So this shows a deeper level of intimacy still. Because there's a lot of times when people might pray for something, and then they get their request granted by God, and then they just go off and wander on their lives and forget that anything ever happened, right? They forget to go back and give thanks. They don't give these songs of praise. They're, that lacks intimacy. It's not treating God as a loving father. It's treating him like a cosmic butler. There's no intimacy there. Right? Giving thanks and singing songs of praise is the move of a person who doesn't just love the gift. They love the giver. Right? There's connection there. You might remember that ten lepers were cleansed. Nine ran off on their way. Only one came back. One wanted to be with Jesus. It's, it's deeper still. But James continues. He says it's intimacy. It's not just intimacy with God, but also intimacy with others. Because his next move to say, if you're sick, call on the elders and they'll come over and pray over you and anoint you with oil. Now that takes intimacy. It takes vulnerability to bring up your personal prayer request to a body of people or to a group or to invite other people into your life. And finally, we see this in prayer, this command to confess. In our prayers to confess, there's, there's intimacy there. If you don't trust me, that requires vulnerability and intimacy, then just go ahead and spend a minute and turn to the person to your left and tell them all the sins you committed this week. That's what I thought, right? Like, so it requires something deep here, right? That, that's the point. So I flew through those verses to kind of show that this heart of desiring to be near to God, but I think we want to pause just for a little bit and zoom in on verses 14 and 15 because they tend to bring up a lot of different questions. They can be tough to definitively interpret. Some people see verses 14 and 15 about calling the elders and praying and healing and anointing of oil as someone who is physically sick, and others view these verses as talking about one who is spiritually sick. Now, I think you can make a case for both of those things. Let me make both of those cases. The one argument for physical sickness makes sense because it says they are sick. Right? It's, it's a pretty clear word, but... And then it says you pray over them and anoint them with oil because oil was a common sort of healing treatment in that day. Think of it as a sort of medicine. In this way, we see this cooperation between both faith and medical care. That's why when we get sick, we don't just take medicine, we also pray. And we don't just pray, we also go see the doctor. We, we trust God to use those two things to work in tandem. So the NIV definitely, and, and many other interpretations and translations lean toward physical healing, 
But a case for spiritual illness can also be made. For where the NIV and many others have the phrase, make the sick person well, the Greek word actually there is save. And it will save you. It will raise you up like this picture of this resurrection. And then it talks about being forgiven of sins. Do you follow? You see how it can be also a spiritual sort of sickness. Now, overall, I think it favors the physical one, but nevertheless, I think we have things we can learn from both. First, we don't get, just get stuck in the mode of only praying for bodies, right? We, we pray for bodies a lot, for people to be well, you know, their, their illnesses and, and tests and things like this. Pray for souls. Man's greatest need is not the physical world. Our greatest enemy is not cancer. It's sin. And we know this. May our prayers reflect that. I think we learned that from this passage. Now, there's a lot more that can be said here, but I want to kind of get back on this main topic of transformation and this relationship with God. Because the person is intimate with God, yes, but they also pray out of righteousness. Right? It says righteousness. Now, earlier in the book, James had criticized the readers for the wrong motives and for being double-minded, but now he has the right stuff. He writes, the prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Again, these couple verses we could go on and on and on about, but it's a lot to unpack. And I'm looking at, at a bigger perspective here today. But I just want to say, like, that sort of verse can be tricky because you take it the wrong way, and you just think, oh, if, I just, if I'm more righteous, if I'm, if I'm a better person, then all my prayers will be answered, and I'll get everything I ever want. And we know that's not true. And we've got to be careful of that sort of works for righteousness. Like, if I'm just a better person, then God will surely hear me. We aren't righteous because of our righteousness. We're righteous because of Christ's righteousness. But nevertheless, James and other places in Scripture command us to pray in righteousness. The Bible does caution in many places against having prayers that are inhibited because of sin in our lives. It is something we should take serious. It is something we should look at. When my prayers aren't being answered, is there, is there sin that is blocking me from God? Now, not necessarily, but it might be. And as we know, like, there's always a mysterious nature to prayer. We know that some requests are granted and others aren't, and we aren't quite sure why. Because we don't often know God's long-range plans. But we know one thing. We see it here clearly. God commands us to pray. And he says prayer is powerful and effective. He commands us to pray often, to pray unceasingly, and to pray with pure motives and to pray according to his will. And to underscore this point, he gives this example from Elijah. He says, Elijah was a human being, even as we are. And now the readers might think, like, oh, really? Like, we're just like Elijah. Right? The same Elijah who prayed for drought, and then there was a drought. And then Elijah who prayed for rain, and then it rained. The, the Elijah who raised the widow's son, who defeated the prophets of Baal. The Elijah who was just whisked away in a, in a cloud and never died. Just like Elijah? James like, yeah, you're just like Elijah. Like, your prayers matter just as much as Elijah's prayers. He was a human like us. Because prayer is powerful because God is powerful. He said, Elijah prayed earnestly. James calls us to pray earnestly, too. Apparently, James is a model of praying earnestly. For if you didn't know, James's old nickname was Old Camel Knees. Apparently, early church historian Eusebius wrote this of James, and I quote, James was frequently found upon his knees begging forgiveness for the people, so his knees became hard like those of a camel, end quote. So that's praying earnestly. So we take these things together, we see this intimacy, and we see righteousness, and we see this earnestness, like all this transformed relationship with God. So he wants to transform us in, and he transforms us up, and he also transforms us out. We see that in verses 19 and 20, how this transformation affects not just here or this, but also out this way. We see a picture of the believer who is mature and complete. For they're now strong enough to lead others as they have been led. Now, we shouldn't be surprised that in James's letter that the last thing he gives is a call to action. Right? Throughout this entire letter, he's been shepherding people. He's been calling them to repentance. 
With deep love, he's been challenging people to return to God. And now he's calling them to do the same. Because there are those who wander from the truth, right? That's what it says. By truth, it's not just doctrine or theology, but just truth in general, from the ways of God. This wandering person is not living how they're called to live. This wandering person maybe is living in perpetual sin. This wandering person who is far from the truth maybe is remaining in unhealthy relationships. Or maybe this person is willingly disconnected and, and left the church. You know, speaking of being disconnected from the church, I think that's the spiritual pandemic that has followed the COVID pandemic. For far too many people, social distancing has become spiritual distancing. And we're not strong enough to walk this road alone. We need one another. The Bible makes that clear. We just read the other day in Hebrews. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Like You need the church, and the church needs you. We're stronger together. So we need leaders who are willing to go out and seek out the lost and the wandering. To seek and to shepherd is not easy to do. It's certainly uncomfortable work, but it's good and it's loving because James says it will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. That's like when, when I'm hearing about Chris and Lucinda sharing faith with their nephew, like my heart just leaps for joy. It's just so thankful for people who are willing to do that. I know we had an elder this week who made a tough phone call of one of our own who's just kind of a, a wandering sheep right now. Like, those are tough conversations, aren't they? Like, maybe you don't like the elders calling. Like, trust me, it's uncomfortable for the elders to make those calls. That's deep love. That's deep commitment to people. You know, I think of times in my past where I'm so thankful for more mature believers who, who brought me back to a good place. Straighten me out on some attitude things. And it was painful at the time. And I didn't want to hear it. It's like getting punched in the gut. Especially because it's from people who I respected so deeply. But then you swallow your pride and you realize, you know what? If they're willing to have that tough conversation, they must really, really care about me. You look in the mirror and you repent. And you change the attitude or whatever it might be. Because it's hard to do. So there's probably some today listening who are wandering. And if that's you and that spirit's kind of pounding on your heart, then hear that as a call to repentance. And there's some today who might have it being on their heart that, yeah, you are mature, you are being led. Now lead. Because you know someone else who is wandering, who needs to be lovingly restored. This is a perfect ending to the letter, I think. It's a perfect picture of one who has been transformed and made new to the point. Like they've been led so well that now that they can lead others. That's discipleship. Transformed now on the in and the up and the out. But that's God's will for our lives. That we would be mature and complete. Consistent all the way through. So as I bring this home, I need to think hard one more time about James's prescription. At the very beginning of the letter. Chapter 1, 18, he said... He chose to give us birth, right? He chose to make us new through the word of truth. And then he says after that, do not just listen to the word, do what it says. Like there's a partnership there. God is transforming us. That is his will for us, that we would be mature and complete, not divided, not double-minded, not inconsistent. He is changing us by the goodness of his gospel, by the power of his spirit. But he says, get on board and do what it says. Transformation happens when you do it, fueled by the Spirit and by the power. So it's not just passive for us. So on the inside, right, James encouraged us to think like Jesus. We look at life through the lenses of Scripture. We see what's important, we see what's not. We realize in this life we're just a mist. We see what really matters. James wants us to talk like Jesus. Jesus didn't grumble, he didn't boast, he didn't mislead with his words. He gave it straight. No conditions to his promises and no fine print. And we're to have the wisdom of Jesus. 
Not indulging the flesh, but feeding the spirit. Not the wisdom of the world, but wisdom from above. That's how he wants us to be transformed on the end. And then on the up, we depend on the Father like Jesus. We pray in all occasions like he did. We pray earnestly and righteously and with deep intimacy. We depend on the Father in all circumstances. And that helps us to persevere in the good and the bad and in the ugly. So we wait on his judgment. We trust that he'll make all things right. We seek him in all things. We submit to him. James says all of this. He says, rely on his wisdom. Put your faith into practice. Keep his royal law. It's something to do. And finally, on the outside, James says, seek and save the lost and the wandering. Treat people without partiality. Serve others humbly. Care for widows and orphans and those who have great needs. Right? It's a whole package. Heart, mind, and soul, the in and the up and the out. All fueled by the gospel and the power of his spirit. The gospel of grace that calls us and the gospel of grace that transforms us to his glory. Amen. Father, we thank you for your good and perfect word. Help us not just to be hearers of your word, but doers of your word, that we might be transformed through your power and through your grace and to your glory. God, as we go forth from this place into the mission field, help us to lead others as we've been led, to serve others as we've been served. Give us new hearts, thoughts, and minds. We thank you for your work in us. In your name we pray. Amen. Reformed in, in all of it, in, in my life, in every step, right? In, in all of it. There's nothing that is not sacred. Um, and I think James has been saying that, like in all of these things, in, in all of life, be transformed in all of it to his glory. Now receive this blessing. May the God of peace sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Amen.
figure out 